I'm Walt Bowers. I am the chief architect for the OSGI Solutions uh, with Hitachi, uh, in particular Hitachi here in America, which we um, the CTA division, the communications and te communications telecommunications uh, division here, and uh, we're going to talk to you about doing um, enabling smart data on M2M -M gateways and aggregators. So. Um, this is kind of the agenda. We'll run through this. Feel free to stop and ask questions at any point if you want to. I'll also give us some time at the end to ask questions. Um, we'll give a brief MDM overview, talk about aggregators, why we think they're kind of important, what role they play, some of the developer challenges with those, and then um, looking at how OSGI helps to solve some of that. And then we'll, I'm going to show you a live demo of, a, of the NFC demo that's being done here in the demo grounds over at uh, the Hilton on the third, third floor, fourth floor, whatever floor that is. And so y'all can start here, so I'll show you that. So we kind of put some of this stuff in action. So first, a quick MDM overview. Is uh, most people, are people familiar with MDM in general? So, you know, this internet of things, the idea of having all your applications talk upstream, you have, uh, bunch of devices, small devices, devices that are becoming more and more intelligent. There's a big push with the Java Embedded conference going on now to push intelligence down to those devices. Most of the time it's going through the cloud, pushing up the enterprise out into the, um, the cloud, collecting global analytics, making decisions about what's going on. And we have everything from telematics like connected vehicles now. You know, your washers and dryers are becoming connected to stuff, you have light switches, there's all kinds of devices, smart meters for smart energy that are out there. A general architecture of it kind of is layered out, uh, is here. And the key here without going into every layer of it is one of the things that Oracle and Hitachi are, are pushing and uh, building the ecosystem around is, is it is Java from end to end. Java from down on to the devices, all the way through Java on the back end of the system. Um, as that gets pushed, as the data gets pushed up into the servers, and as we make smart decisions down on the client side device. For this talk, we're going to focus on that client side device. The, the back end piece is, they're probably talking about that down the street at the Moscone Center. Here, I'm going to focus on, on this piece and, and what we need to do down on this, uh, the aggregator side of it. So what are aggregators? With all these little devices and all the sensors and all the various things are out there, kind of think of an aggregator as a device to control all the other devices. Um, you have various things running around in these, in these networks, everything from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, DECT, uh, IP with other protocols over the IP. How do you talk to all those devices? How do you collect the data? How do you make actionable data and smart data out of the things around there? And that's what an aggregator will do for you. Um, in the network, the picture before had one big kind of cloud, that first picture that I showed. Here, what you see is if you had a house over there with the blue roof, you have an aggregator there collecting some sensor and some data from the, uh, the house. That may be being pushed up to the cloud. Down here in the, uh, the orange roof, you have, it might be industrial, it might be big medical, uh, where you're also collecting sensor data and data from all these devices, sending them up to the cloud. If you're a car, there are tons of sensor data on a car. I don't know if, how much you're aware of it. Outside of your little LCD screens now that show you infotainment, they are now putting the ability to gather the sensor data from all the stuff that they use when you go and plug into um, the mechanic now, when they plug into the computer and tell you everything that's going on in your car so you can know your tire pressure, what your latest gas mileage is, everything else. So they're aggregating all that data now on, uh, on vehicles. And then of course, into the cloud from the back end, you've got people who want to use it to see the data, to make decisions about the data. So 
these gateways, these aggregators, are kind of forming a dual role. role. The first one is, how do you control this myriad of sensors that you have out in, the, out in that loca local area or that locale that you're in? Um, you need to be able to aggregate that data, grab it from them. Um, you need to provide local management. How do you know whether your Zigbee device went off or online? Right? It's a local, low-powered RF signal. It may only reach from here to the back of the room, then it does a mesh to go to the next thing. How do you know whether one of those things went out or not? Um, in some models that you see, people are talking about, well, maybe that all gets pushed directly back to the cloud. But if you start thinking about the numbers of those devices, that's a lot. And how do you manage that from back all the way up in the cloud for those individual sensors in a house or a hospital or a car? Um, so you're providing that type of management. Um, you're also providing management of um, what I like to call local analytics, or you could call it edge analytics, which is, can I be smart about what I do with the data? In particular, think about uh, communications industry. If I have a truck that's carrying, it's a refrigeration truck, it's carrying food on it, I'm monitoring a bunch of different things on that truck, including its gas mileage, its, you know, how the truck is working. I'm also measuring the refrigeration. I now might be measuring, did something tip over in the back? How far did it drop? So a lot of times I'm collecting that data, and I really don't need it for anything right now. I can afford to wait till I pull into a sta docking station somewhere, get Wi-Fi, upload it over a fast Wi-Fi local network, and push it to the cloud that way. But if I'm carrying strawberries to Walmart, they happen to be peculiar about how far a pallet can drop before they reject that pallet of strawberries. What if you find out they dropped? That's a decision I might not be able to make locally. I need to crank up my 3G network, fire off something to the cloud, so that guy can make some bigger decisions. Those might be, it's $1,000 or $10,000 worth of strawberries, and you've got $5 million worth of stuff on the truck. Take it all. We know they're going to reject it. It could be, though, that, you know what? We've dropped too many pallets already. Walmart's going to be upset if we deliver another pallet of dropped strawberries. Stop the truck, turn it around, don't worry about the other stuff on there, right? It's making a, a different business decision based on global knowledge instead of local knowledge. But you want that ability to do that local analytics. You want the ability on the, on the gateway side to say, hey, what if I need to... Um, change the temperature in the back of the truck? What if I can sense what the sun temperature is outside, right? So I know my lead time on cooling the inside of the truck. So as I feel the outside temperature getting warmer, I can automatically start raising, you know, cooling the temperature inside to be ahead of the game, right? Especially if you're a truck driving through the Mojave Desert. Um, so that type of things. But the other things you want to be able to do is to change that behavior dynamically. Based on global analytics, you want the bigger picture. So that guy's taking pictures of the trucks driving through the deserts all over the place. And they may now determine that you need to start sooner of cooling the truck in the back to keep things from perishing, right? Because they're noticing a trend. You want to be able to now download to that aggregator to say locally, change your decision making. Start sooner. Right? And that's something that the, the local guy couldn't have known. He has to get that from the global. So that's the role that we see. Those are kind of the, the two major roles that we see these aggregators playing in the MDM space. So what are some of the developer challenges of building one of these aggregators? Typically, there are a lot being done by embedded development right now in the MDM space. And so they follow kind of a traditional development model, which is I have my hardware, usually has a, some sort of Linux kernel on it. I go do my apt get for GCC, crank up my VI, start writing my C code. Maybe, I'm, maybe I use Eclipse and download and compile with, you know, and download it. And I'm writing basically C code directly to the kernel. That's the way the majority of the embedded development is still done today. Um, 
But here's the, the big problem with that. Which aggregator do you, which aggregator device do you pick to run your application on? Because when you do that, as you know, I have challenges depending on which one of these guys I picked. Did I pick a, you know, if I'm doing a home application, is it an Action Tech home router or is it a Zizel home router? Am I going to use a plug computer? You know, was my processor ARM? Was it MIPS? Was it PowerPC? Is it an Intel box? All those things start to come into play when you start to write your application for that guy, right? So as we know, C, you're going to be tightly coupled to the CPU. It's hard to change the apps. Um, and mainly, running on other devices becomes complicated. So you might have had a good solution for a particular market on a particular gateway, but you now can't take it to another gateway. The same application that can monitor temperature on a refrigeration truck could do the same thing in this room here, right? You could sense what, in San Francisco, you can't just go by time of day, right? As we've noticed the past couple of days, it could start out in the week where at seven o'clock in the morning it's 45 degrees. And by now, yesterday I think it was like 80 by nine o'clock if you were standing in the sun, right? That same app could work here and do the exact same thing you did with the truck with some slightly different parameters. But unfortunately, you wrote yours for the aggregator that they use on the truck, right? Not the one that, that they would put in this building, which might be on a standard Wi-Fi router inside here. Obviously, one of the main solutions to that is you put Java on the device, right? Uh, I'm assuming since everybody's here, you're Java programmers. So big push in the conference starting uh, today with Java embedded is you can put Java embedded on that device. Uh, that ranges everywhere from very small Java MECLDC and Java card all the way up through Java, Java SE embedded. Um, if you don't know a lot about the Java embedded, SE embedded um, direction and what's going on, uh, Bob Vendetti's is doing a talk tomorrow. He, it's a duplicate of the one that he did yesterday where he kind of gives a roadmap of what they're doing with Java embedded and the different profiles and this, the size you can get that down to. Um, but there's still some challenges. What about lifecycle management? So I want to do this dynamic loading and updating. I still have that issue now with, with Java. What do I do? Right? I want to be able to install, uninstall, start, stop, update these applications on the fly without impacting the other behavior of the box. Just because I want to change the temperature thing, you know, uh, dynamic on my truck, doesn't mean that I want to uh, stop monitoring the gas mileage or the brakes or other stuff while I change it out and reboot the JVM to load a new to load this new application on it. Uh, you may have the need to run multiple versions of the same app at the same time. Just based on sensor data, other stuff, you may have old sensors, new sensors of the same type, you may have things you need to run. And again, dynamically changing that behavior is one of the things you want to be able to do. But worse than that is, what is the sensor environment that you're going into? First, you got these blue things, which are the protocols. Do I have Zigbee? Do I have Z-Wave? Is it X10? Is it Bluetooth? Is it Lopan? Maybe, maybe it's using DECT. Maybe it's using Modbus. Maybe it's using Profinet. There's just a gajillion of these sensor protocols out there. And once you solve that, then you've got to figure out, well, what sensor is it talking to? Is it a thermostat? Is it a glucose monitor? Right? Is it a blood pressure monitor? Um, is it an accelerometer? You know, a motion detector? W what am I talking to? So, when you look at that, that device problem that we solved originally with Java becomes magnified now because you have the, every combination and permutation of that. Was it an intelligent smart plug connected to X10, Z-Wave, or Zigbee? If you know anything about the protocols, you'd have to write a different, different application to talk to those three different plugs. So now just imagine you're doing that for every device and you're trying to work in a bigger environment. So as um, I think they said in the keynote, the Java keynote, when they were talking about Java embedded, is you know they're trying to get the nine million Java developers to focus on the embedded space. But that's not going to happen if every Java developer has to learn this type of information every time, right? Because 
We don't have the time to learn that. You want to write the application. You want to write the intelligent piece, the piece that's determining what to do with all the sensors and when to upload the data and doing the smart analytics and coordinating with the global analytics. Most people really don't want to go learn the gory details of Zigbee or Z-Wave. There may be a few in here, um, but you know, that's, most of the people, that's not what we want to be doing. And that's not how you get 9 million developers talking to the embedded space, because that's going to be a small percentage of those 9 million that want to get down to that level. So our solution to that is we put OSGI now on top of the Java. And uh, so the combination of Java with OSGI gives you these smart data aggregators for the MDM space. Oops. So uh, how many people are familiar with OSGI or know about OSGI? Wow. That's cool. They usually don't get that many hands. People have either just barely heard of it, but, uh, well, good. So, if you notice on that first slide where Java fits in, it's fitting in above the Java embedded. It's providing uh, container services, et cetera. Actually, if you know anything about uh, Glassfish is up here, that they also, Oracle now also has a product to run Glassfish on some of the embedded space. It runs on top of Java, uh, OSGI. It's an OSGI-enabled uh, application container for it. And um, so I, I don't have to hit this hard because I think most of the people raise their hands for being familiar with OSGI. You know you have the dynamic loading. I can load bundles in and out dynamically. I can start and stop them. I can have multiple versions of a bundle. I can group bundles into deployment packages so that I can have a, kind of an entire application suite that's deployed at the same time and managed as a, as a group. Um, because of that, I can run multiple apps on that same device. I can kind of take the apps in and out. We'll come back to this a little bit more in a minute, the, the shared services. Um, services make what we're going to talk about, this abstraction and being able to make some of this stuff vanilla to everybody possible. Uh, the microservices that it does where you can publish, you can track, you can uh, go query, what services are available. The services dynamically come in and out of scope. You can listen for the services so that you can really in a dynamic way, especially in the sensor environment, um, leverage pieces underneath so that you don't have to worry about some of these details of sensors. And then because of the dynamic loading and other stuff, you can do remote management. So this can actually be connected to a cloud server or a management server up in the enterprise that downloads the applications to do your dynamic updating of uh, your business logic. So this is what the picture looks like that we showed earlier once we add uh, in the Java and the OSGI. So you have your Java, um, it could be SE embedded or ME, your OSGI framework. On top of that you have these abstraction Bundles, this is where you could think of also is where the compendiums would sit. If you're familiar with OSGI, you get all the compendiums, everything. Then you start adding layers in this blue of applications and applications on top of applications, right? So now I can come up with energy control application that gets abstracted from the Zigbee and the Z-Wave. And then I can then go write an application bundle that can take care of energy control. But then it can also go look at appliance control and start to figure out Oh, I can delay the start of the washing machine based on the energy usage in the house, right? Uh, or any other device that may be a heavy load uh, device for that. So, you know, this new model, while it looks like there's a lot of heaviness added to the embedded device, turns out not so much. This can get down into, you can get Java SE embedded coming in Java 8. We have a version for Java 1.7 that you can get into about 10 meg of flash. The OSGI framework, full blown with compendiums, is only about another 1.5 meg. If you just need the framework itself, it's you know a couple hundred k. Um, if you go Java ME, you can get that under like four meg of flash for CDC. If you need CLDC, you can go even smaller um, for that. So on top of that, and this is just kind of another view of it is, 
adding these abstraction layers. So what we're showing here is as you get into that, what was kind of that purple blue area, I now start to add abstractions. And I add abstractions on a top of abstractions. One of the things we're going to show here is I have ZigBee Z and Z-Wave running on this device over here. And we have a th uh, another layer called Pan Services, which abstracts the ZigBee and the Z-Wave interface. So you could write just a ZigBee if you wanted to, or you can just talk to our Pan Services and know, I want, I want a thermostat. Is there a thermostat out there? Is there a uh, smart switch? Is there something that's measuring humidity? Right? And I don't care how it was connected. Zigbee, Z-Wave, X10. Right? Don't care. I just want the device. We're also doing that with um, the 3G and 4G cellular networks. As if you've ever dealt with that, you know a modem is not a modem is not a modem. It's supposed to be all the AT command set, but it's not all the same AT command set. And whether you're using the Huawei or the Ericsson chips and antenna depends on what kind of AT command set, and sometimes it depends on who you're connecting to. Again, your application just wants to send an SMS message, right? It doesn't want to have to know the AT command set of the Huawei chip to send an AT command set. Um, so then you build your applications in on top of that. And one of the things I'm going to show here in a little bit is this Java 1 NFC demo that we built on top of these PAN services to do this. Um, one of the key pieces of this and, and one of the, the um, main areas that, that makes this possible, we talked about earlier, was is the OSGI services. Um, I don't know... You've probably used them if you've used OSGI. They are extremely powerful. I know last year at Java 1, there was the guys that wrote OSGI in action, did a whole talk on how to do OSGI services and some of the cool stuff that you can do with them. Uh, you know, and the big thing is, is that they're dynamic. So with OSGI services, when I abstract that USB port, so the way our code is actually written, and we take advantage of it, so we kind of practice what we preach for this. We first abstracted a serial USB. Actually, what we did is we abstracted a serial interface. Then there's like a serial USB interface. All right? Once you have that, when you plug in one of these dongles, they show up as a USB serial port. That's the way they show up in Linux. You had to work through some complexities of figuring out whether that shows up as dev TTY USB 0 or dev TTY USB slash 0 or dev, because unfortunately Linux is not Linux is not Linux when it comes to that. Um, but again, that's some of the complexities that these abstraction layers are taken out of the, taken out of the equation for the then developer, right? With that, though, I can now listen and say, at my higher level, say, hey, let me know when something plugs in. Then I can discover what that is, and you discover it by using some metadata, because all the USB devices give you metadata. So the Zigbee and the Z-Wave can now listen to the USB services with a service tracker and say, hey, just let me know when stuff plugs in. If a, USB, if a Zigbee plugs in, he can now go connect to that dongle and start to say, what devices do you have? Then he now publishes those as services upstream from him so that people that are just listening for Zigbee and Z-Wave now know something happened. That gets pushed up to the PAN services. So now, from an application developer, you could listen at that higher level and just say, let me know when a thermostat comes online, right? Because I, I have a thermostat application, and I don't. that's what I want to know. Um, so that's how they're really being used. It also allows um, you to use them in ways that the original developer didn't expect. So you can start to do mashups of these things. That other picture before where I showed, you know, now suddenly somebody who just thought they wanted to do this thermostat thing now realizes that they could start talking to the washing machine, decides, I can, oh, I can combine these two services in a way that neither of the original guys thought about or the original developers thought about. So that starts to expand what you can do on these gateways and aggregators and making intelligent decisions and controlling, uh, controlling everything or down on the device. 
since we're at Java 1, I think everybody has to put code snippets in their slides. So this is not meant, meant to be a tutorial on the best practices of how to use OSGI services. If you want that, I do recommend that book, OSGI in Action. Go get it. They'll explain it. Good details. Uh, but this is just kind of an example here where if I just wanted a, a, a smart plug, which I have a couple of them over here, I can just go out and basically query the service and say, hey, do you have a service that's a smart plug? I get my reference. Now I can go turn the smart plug on. I really didn't have to know anything about Zigbee Z-Wave X10 to do that from an application standpoint. Um, as kind of another example, uh, which is pretty standard too, uh, OSGI comes with one of the compendiums as an HTTP service. So one of the things you can do is listen for the HTTP service, right? This is just kind of a standard way so you can know you set up a service tracker because there's some, you now, the reason you want to, um, your personal service tracker here is when the HTTP service comes up online, you now have servlets and stuff you want to register with it, right, to provide an interface to the outside world. So that's, you know, kind of some examples. But again, for gory details, I recommend OSGI in action. There's a whole bunch of other ones, but that's a good book for, for learning OSGI and how to do that. Were there any questions on that, on that part? Yes? So what do you use for provisioning to help to these? Do you use Ace or something like that? Yeah, so Hitachi provides, we work a lot with the telecommunications group, and we have actually a back-end server that will also provision bundles down to the system. Uh, there are other ways to do that, too, uh, with, and if you're, Tracking standards, the Broadband Forum is working with the OSGI Alliance to add some stuff so that an ACS system can do it. Uh, the latest versions with PD-194 allow some of that for kind of more standard provisioning systems to do that. Uh, Hitachi provides one of those to provision the apps onto the devices. Uh, and we take advantage of taking bundles and putting them in deployment packages as well so you can wrap that wrap a bundle, a set of bundles inside a deployment package to make it easier to manage um, down to the device. And the yes. Super J framework that was on there, can you describe a little bit about what that does on top of OSGI? Yeah. Actually, Super J framework is just our marketing name for OSGI, for our OSGI framework. So Hitachi has a commercially available OSGI framework that's 4.2 compliance and to be 4.3. Super J is kind of the whole family that we have. So we have a uh, SDKs, you can also license the JVM through us. We have a source license for the JVM from Oracle, so we can port to various devices and chipsets that Oracle doesn't port to. Um, it also includes the OSGI framework. Then it also includes the management system that you can get, and we license them independently. They're all written so that you can, you can kind of plug and play which piece you want out of that. No, it's our own. It's our own. We, um, yeah, it's, it's not based on Felix or Equinox. It's our own pure implementation of it that's been enhanced for the embedded space. So for the OSGI people, you know that OSGI started as an embedded, you know, it was open services gateway initiative. Of course, now it just stands for OSGI, right? Um, and the idea was to provide this type of services on home gateways, home routers, those small devices. In the early 2000s with Eclipse and somewhere in there, right, it, got, it started to move into the enterprise space and the enterprise space sucked a lot of the wind out of OSGI in the embedded space. Hitachi actually focused on OSGI in the embedded space. So part of what our framework does is it's been optimized for a smaller footprint startup times, we try to take things into account that you're running on a resource constrained device. So that's how we differentiate from whether you're gonna go get Felix or Equinox is, that's, what, that's the value add that we're adding to that framework is to be optimized for these types of devices and smaller. Good question. Any other questions? Well, cool, so I put some extra slides in here in case 
the demo gods wasn't working for me either like they didn't work for Mark. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's yeah, it's actually kind of funny. I probably shouldn't say that in here, but it's uh, if it can happen at the Java 1 keynote, then you don't feel bad about trying anything in a session, right? Because at that point, you go, okay, look, it, it can happen to anybody, right? So um, I'm going to switch over. And let me make sure all my internet connections. The other thing is, is whenever you're in a building and I don't know whether Oracle is using their own network or going through the hotel network, you're, you're basically playing Russian roulette if you ever have to go outside. Okay, cool. That's all working. Now we'll switch back and I'll show you kind of what the, uh, what, what the demo looks like. So I'm going to use the same diagram that I was showing you before so I can show you kind of the different pieces that we've put into this demo. Um, and I'm going to go from the bottom up. So we have both Zigbee and Z-Wave devices. Two of the things that we have is a Z-Wave multi-sensor. It actually senses temperature, the light intensity, and the humidity. It also does motion detection. We're not using that for this one. It's not an accelerometer. It's a your standard kind of motion detection. So we're not, we're not using that for this device. Then we also have a Zigbee smart energy switch. It allows you to turn stuff off and on, but it also measures your, your electrical pull, your amperage pull for that. Um, so we're using those two uh, types of uh, sensors down at the bottom. We built it on top of a um, global scale mirror box. It's this little white box up here. You can come look at it afterwards. Uh, it's basically, if you're familiar with a plug computer, it's an ARM chip, small form factor, low power, uh, running Linux on it. I it, it, um, can't remember if they're actually available now or they're going to be available very shortly. It has Linux and OSGI Java uh, on it. On top of that, we have our OSGI framework. We're also using JEZ, the <coughs> Java embedded suite that was, I think, announced last week, this week. Um, we're showing some interaction between those two where we're making some local decisions and local analytics and collecting the data. Primarily the OSGI is collecting all the data and controlling all the sensor data. And then we're passing some of that information over to Jez. They're making some local business rule decisions and then talking up to C Control, which is a company uh, that collects sensor data and displays it. And then they're collecting it at a global cloud level. So those are kind of the, 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 the key pieces that, that, w that went into the, um, into the demo. So I can show you now. So one other piece that we added to it to make it interesting is a contest. So we added an NFC, uh, near field communication reader. So you can scan. It'll keep up with your scans. We also added a little fidgets LCD display. This is a headless device, so it doesn't have any real display. So we, um, we added that piece to it. Now I don't have fancy GUIs to talk to the, uh, the backing piece. So this is a, there's a simple web service running on top of the device that's collecting all the sensor data so that you can see the sensor data that we're collecting locally. So put this guy under here. I think I did that earlier and I think he loses enough light um, that you'll be able to see it. Uh, just to let you know, because people ask, we're not kind of cheating with the USB cable. It turns out that the, this particular device, since it can be battery powered, so you can carry it around, uh, but when you put it on battery, it only updates every four minutes. That's a long time to wait in a demo to see something happen. So we um, we, um, you can see the lights going down. Uh, so we changed it to um, power powering it with the USB because then you can configure it and we can update every 10 seconds. So we can get a lot more data. It make, makes for a much better, uh, much better reaction time for a presentation. Uh, and, we, and as you can also see, we're doing the energy management. We're pulling the, the amps from here. So that's what's happening kind of locally on here. Um, Again, I have a, that smart switch. This is another just simple app that we have that allows me to turn off and on. My laptop's plugged up to it, so it's going to blink. 
Um, and we'll see that the, the power will change in the time frame that we're waiting for this and we'll get other data for that. All this data is being pushed up to C control. Um, and they are collecting it. There are 13 of these stations out in the demo grounds. Um, so the Hitachi one right here, we're overloading it. So you can see now my power went down over here. My light went back up to 165. Some of the nice things that they do for this, this is kind of that global analytics versus local analytics, is I can look at trends. I can look at my... Um, what's happening with uh, the, the power. I can look at all kinds of reports. They're collecting all this global, global data for us. Um, so here's some the power trends that we're putting in here. You can see the different um, light trends over all the sensors versus light. There's a NetBeans booth out there and where its trends are. Um, so all of this data is being collected. Now, if you're interested, if you hadn't been out to the demo grounds, you can actually play the, the game and win a Kindle. Uh, you can also win prizes locally. So the other thing that we tied into to gather just more sensor data is you can uh, scan with the NFC reader. We now read that. We report that information upstream. Locally, Jez is making some decisions about local winners, collecting data. It's also doing checks like, oh, you can't, if I scan, if I try to scan too many times, just back to back to back, it will uh, it'll give a warning. Uh, it's also checking things for alarming of how fast, how close things are together for that, um, and just collecting more data. When you get one of these cards, you get a user ID and a password that you can log into the C Control site and take a look around at that and also see what stations you've been at and some of your own personal data from your scan card that's been pushed up there. Not to worry, Oracle being the, um, having plenty of lawyers, none of your information from your Java 1 conference is available to this, so that's why it's tied to this user ID and stuff. So uh, we, we were not able to in time get it worked through. We wanted to try to do some other social social media things around this where scanning so you would know, oh, were the people that attended this session also the same people that attended other sessions with you together and you could kind of go see that, but um, they were concerned about too much of your private information going out. So we don't have that, so that's why you get a, your own user ID and password on that. Um, just a couple of other things real quick since we have this up. We also have a web interface that if you were developing the apps, you can push down your bundles, your services. Uh, again, you can see on here, these are the bundles that we have running. These are uh, services that we're running. So we have like a Z-Wave controller. We have the PAN service running. An NFC reader is its own service, so you can detect whether it comes in and out, and we listen for whether we detach it or attach it. In our booth, we have a booth up right by the demo grounds. We also have a demo of where you can uh, unplug and plug in the Zigbee and the Z-Wave, and it will dynamically show you whether the device is there or not. So you can, you can play around with that, um, as well as a connected home demo and then one of these NFC stations that you can uh, scan at. If you scan here, you'll also be registered at the Hitachi booth too, so I'm kind of over overloading that particular piece of it. Um, that was just a scan for the card. Any questions on that? So we're, th this is actually using the, the, the same techniques that we talked about for the aggregators and using that mirror box as an aggregator of the different sensor types. And we could connect more sensors to it, continue to aggregate that data, and then make smart decisions down locally. So, and that's why we put together the demo for Java 1, was to show that capability in the embedded space, in the endem space. Any questions? If you want to, before I have to take it down, I have plenty of time. You can come grab a card and scan. Yes? I'm just curious. I, 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 um, so 
it becomes really interesting when all these things are using wireless and battery operated and all that, and they're basically just floating around, right? Yes. And I, I, I'm just curious, like if you have such a small device that runs Java, uh, how long typically will that run on a whatever standard battery? Uh, do, do you have to, you know, just curious what... what yeah, um, yeah, I hate to say it, it depends, but the, the one of the things that they are doing with the new CLDC versions of Java that would run down on a lot like a small battery powered device is taking that exactly into account is what do I need to do to minimize my, my pull on the processor. Um, on this guy we're running the SE embedded so we assume that you've got that, that, that you're not running off from battery power for that guy. And these particular sensors don't run Java. Okay. So, um, yeah, that should probably point that out too. They're just pure Zigbee and Z-Wave. So they're not yet running Java down at the sensor level, um, which is another potential issue. I know that the push is to try to get Java down as close to the devices as possible. And when they do that, they do have to take into account the battery. But like, maybe cool. that's not even necessary, as you say. Like, you know, if it's just a simple, you know, temperature device or something like that. As long as you can read the data, you know, maybe you don't need Java all that level. Yeah, and, and that's where it becomes interesting. Of, of where, where do you push Java? Mm -hmm. You know, how far down? Yeah. There are some controllers, and in some, especially if you're starting to get into factory automation and some things like that, where you're you're going to want more intelligence even closer, or the ability to change things even closer. For sensors like these, moving it up to that aggregator level where you just let the sensor manufacturer do whatever they need to do, because some of them are very simple, right? Just measuring temperature doesn't require a lot of intelligence, right? Um, measuring humidity doesn't. So a lot of those things, don't you don't need the intelligence at the device. There are some other devices that you might with you know, the, way, the way the accelerometers and all that other stuff is working, there might be some reasons that you'd want some actually some more intelligence on that guy to make some decisions for you or so you could tweak it and change it, change sensitivity and stuff easier than you could. That's a good question. Yes? You mentioned uh, the case earlier where you're using GSM. Um, I imagine there's, a lot of, there's certainly a lot of use cases for GSM. Um, what are you doing for data compression uh, to Assuming you're passing to the C control server software. Yeah, so in this particular demo, what we're just using a we're just using broadband connections. But when you're using GSM and you're you're going out that way, so um, right now in, in our current stuff, we're not compressing it to optimize that. That is something on our roadmap to, to look at how we can take so as we provide that upper information to you. Uh, that it could be compressed, but it also then needs somebody on the other side that's kind of taking some of that off. One of the main ways we see in limiting the GSM usage, et cetera, so unless you're like in a, a vending machine where you might not have access to anything but GSM or you're in a truck on a road when you need to do that is, is trying to be smart about when you send the data. Uh, I think there's a very big danger in the MDIM space that you're going to get uh, dirty data or just cluttered data and it's just going to be data just that that's not actionable right um, I think some of that is how you're going to need to limit so why you need to you know you can make smart decisions about when you send the data and do I really need to send it or can I do smart things like if my temperature didn't change for 30 minutes or an hour I didn't need to send a report every 10 seconds. I could have just reported it when it changed and let you know that it changed for the last, that it hadn't, you know, that the last hour it was this temperature. So those are some of the things that, so that intelligent part we're doing now, the actual trying to compress it over the line we're not doing right now. So is it something that you are going to be looking into? It is something that we are looking into, yes, as part of that, part of the abstraction layer in, in there and to help developers not have to worry about that piece, but so that we can help compress that and optimize the, the network. Yep. Good question. Any other questions?
Cool. Well, thank you. You can come up and grab a card and scan. And then if you hit at least six of the other of these scan stations, they look prettier than this, by the way. They're all mounted and stuff up in the demo grounds. If you hit at least six of them, then you uh, qualify to register for a Kindle. That I think they're raffling off at four o'clock. So uh, feel free to do that. If you have any other questions, you can uh, uh, talk to me afterwards. You can also, my contact, my slides will be, are uploaded so you can download the slides and uh, also I was going to go my contact information is on the is on the last slide so you can uh, I will pull that <coughs> up for you yeah so if, if other questions come up or something comes up or you have any ideas feel free to email me um, I'll be glad to get your information or answer any other questions, especially if other stuff comes up for you. Thank you.